uh, we try to people register for the programs and then sometimes can't make it and uh, want to go back and look at it or sometimes the speakers want to see how they did and they want to look at it or you might want to get refreshed so we'll, they'll be up on the website uh, in a couple of days usually and uh, we'll, they won't be up there forever but they'll be around if you ever need to and want to go back um, my name is Larry Wade. I'm the president of the Oregon Carvers Guild and also the leader of the what's called the Carving Special Interest Group. So we have two carving activities in the Portland metro area. The Guild of Oregon Woodworkers was formed in the mid 70s and has about uh, round numbers, a thousand members and about um, 100 and 20 or so of those have an interest in carving of some type, and I'm a member of that, and serve uh, the, and coordinate the carving activities for that. About the same time in Portland, the Western Woodcarvers Association was formed, and it grew to be very large, and then it grew to be very small. And it was on the verge of folding last summer, so Jerry Boone and I, joined by three others, uh, made a commitment to rebuild it and get a uh, a good club for the Portland metro area. And obviously trying to do that in the era of Zoom is an interesting issue because we can't meet, but we've, uh, we're doing okay. And we're growing the membership. And for those of you that are members, thank you. And for those of you that aren't, you might want to think about it. Uh, Jerry Boone is online from Mesa. He lives in Aloha uh, other, otherwise. Terry Burnside is online. He's got a, looks like a red plaid jacket. He's the uh, board secretary and the IT webmaster guy, and Roger Crooks might be on. And then Marty Lawrence is handles memberships and some programming, and she's currently hanging out in Maine for a while, and she'll be back in a month or so. Um, also want to invite the Central Cal the California Carvers Guild, Gary, he's got a this strange name, but Gary is Gary Lehans is in the Ventura era as president of the California Carvers Guild, which is a big deal because California is a big deal, and they have about 40 different active clubs in the, the state, and Gary's uh, in the statewide organization. And then there's some, I know Al is online from Ventura. They have a, a group down in that area, and Gary also is in Ventura. I won't go through everybody, but there's a contingent from the Santa Clara uh, the Valley Carvers Club, San Jose area. So welcome to you. And for those in Central, Central Oregon, thank you for being part of us and joining our, our group tonight. And I look forward to having more of um, more opportunity. Uh, there'll be opportunities for questions. Uh, George will ask and encourage you to challenge him or to ask questions. You can ask some of those verbally, but we'll have a relatively large group of um, probably 30 to 35 would be my guess. You can also put questions in chat and I will monitor those and feed those to George. And uh, George, as he goes through his presentation, will take some pauses and we'll go through that. Um, make a couple of pitches. These, tonight's program is our monthly program. It's always on the second Tuesday of the month, except in down months. We probably won't do anything in July and August but and or December. But we get April will be a program, uh, a presentation on an overview of power carving tools from Dremels to NSKs and micromotors, grinders, Fordhams in between. For those that have an interest in uh, but have not done anything with power carving. I think it's an opportunity to get an overview of that. But if you do have experience, we'd love to have you share your your experience, your biases, your preferences, your sources, and it's going to serve as a as a panel to Roger Crooks, who will be doing that. For those of you that know Jeff Harness, Jeff will be the speaker in May. Uh, he's actually doing a two part. We'll do it on the second Tuesday and the third Tuesday. And he will do a uh, two 90 minute programs, uh, basically a class on finishing carvings with acrylics. Our June speaker was uh, got COVID and is on a six to nine month recovery program. As an author who wrote a book on soap carving, both for 
beginners, for kids, and uh, but also for experienced carvers as a medium for modeling and doing things. But unfortunately, we got to figure out a plan B for that. Um, we have two classes coming up. Uh, Terry Burnside just finished a two-session class on carving wood spirits, and that looks like this on a dowel uh, using three tools, and he's got a repeat of that class starting on April 15th and the 22nd, so there's a week apart, and you can join that. These are free. And there's also the fourth instance of a relief carving class that runs for six weeks. Starts a, the fourth class of that will start on April 19th, and that's uh, the, the tuition. You have to spend ten bucks for some wood, and you have to get access to some tools. We have some loaner kits if you want it. We also have a quarterly, an important quarterly membership meeting for those that are part of the Western Wood Carvers Association, Oregon Carvers Guild. We're going to re we're rewriting the bylaws and the articles of incorporation, both to do the effect the name change, but also to establish ourselves as an official 501c3 charitable organization. Uh, we want to be able to uh, do that. Right now, it's not. I will spotlight uh, George, and George will get started in a moment. Uh, George is new to me. Uh, George. Uh, got involved with us from the January program, and we had a retrospective of uh, Leroy Stetzel's life. Leroy Stetzel was probably the most prolific, perhaps the best known carver in Oregon history. Uh, died in 2005-ish. Uh, he did over a thousand pieces of work in his lifetime, architectural, monumental stuff for many cases. Uh, uh, well known for it, for the uh, Salishan Lodge carving panels that he did there in 1965, which put him on the map. But George joined that program and a post-program discussion, and then it became clear that we had uh, he had interest uh, in, and a personal connection with, uh, with with Leroy. So George, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so I got to find you on my screen because I just disappeared. Hang on a minute. There we go. So I'm going to spotlight George, and we are recording. I think we are ready to go. Okay, George. Oh, I just lost okay. you. All right. Thank you. Um, George Blackman. I'm in Redmond, Oregon, and uh, I belong to the Central Oregon Woodcarvers. And uh, we've had some wonderful gatherings, and I'll go through a little bit of my history. Uh, I started many, many years ago, carving soap in the back of my parents' uh, vacation car. So I've always been interested <laughs> a little bit. But uh, when I went to Oregon State, uh, through a couple of uh, majors that didn't agree with me, I wound up in art and I just absolutely fell in love with wood carving and uh, continued on and I did some welding sculpture and then I later did some bronze cast sculpture and that involves some more welding and by the time I got done with that I was thinking about going on to teach you know my masters etc um, when I started looking at programs I realized that my style of art was uh, totally out of place so I went to work for a living and I spent my working years as a titanium welder George about let me just interrupt George, let me interrupt yeah. for a second. Would everybody please mute their microphones if you're not talking? Uh, we need to cut cut down on the background noise. <laughs> so hang on, hang on, George, just a minute. Sure, sure. I know what that does. Okay. So if we got a few more people, please mute yourself. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, George. Okay. Uh, so after I was working and moving towards retirement, uh, ran across a guy who was in blacksmithing. And boy, that was really fun. So I started going into blacksmithing with the idea of making wood carving tools. And uh, then I got distracted doing this wonderful blacksmith stuff for about 10 years. And now I'm back into making wood carving tools again. So I have a whole blacksmith shop. 
But what I'm going to talk to you about today is how to make wood carving tools without the blacksmith shop. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk a little bit about tools and sharpening. And the first subject is uh, what kind of bevel you put on the back of your tool. And this isn't my idea. I've come across this in several very experienced, well-known carvers. Uh, so that the bevel matches how you hold your tool. If you hold your tool with your left hand, you should be able to, as soon as you slide your or a tool, you can enter the wood. And if your bevel is too abrupt, you have to raise your hand off of the wood and you give up <coughs> control and accuracy, depth control and accuracy. So this is a, a lot of very well-known carvers say, keep your hand on the wood. And I have found that that's a very good advice. And so if you have your hand on the wood, when you enter it and you measure the distance from the wood to the center of the handle, and then you measure the distance from the edge back to that line, you can lay it out. And it doesn't, you, it, this is very difficult to measure in degrees, but you can measure the height and the distance. And then you go to your grinder, or I use a belt sander, but and then you put that angle, the height and the length, and put a mark on your table, and then visually grind the back of your tool to that angle. Then when you're holding on to the tool, you're in contact with the wood and the edge enters the the tool enters the wood with very, very good control. Now, some people are gonna say, oh, that's way too delicate. That's too long a taper, it'll break. If you use this on the back, you can re-strengthen it by putting a small inside bevel, depending on your style of carving, the hardness of the wood, how you feel about that. Uh, but if you make all your tools match how you hold it, they will all stay in the wood as soon as you uh, put your hand down. So that's a, a subject for discussion and you have questions, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, another one I was talking about tool design. If you're carving a bowl or a spoon, if you carve down the, the wood grain is like this and you carve with the grain here until it starts biting in and then you carve this way. There's always a spot in the middle that you can't carve from the ends. And so you wanna carve from the side and off of the, uh, you have a straight tool, you go down the side, there's some point where the, it interferes. You can't make through that bottom of the bowl. So if you take, a flat chisel, heat it up and bend it, put your same bevel on the back, this will reach the bottom of the bowl and reach up the other side a little bit. And you can smooth out that final bowl form with a flat chisel. And the thing that really makes it work, if you have a, a flat chisel and your corners dig in, I learned this one from a tool I bought on eBay. You can see the shape of the, end of this one. This happens to be a gouge, but uh, if you take a, I have one here somewhere. Well, this is a, a flat chisel. If you put a radius on the end, that becomes a very, very shallow gouge. It, it uh, gets the corners up out of the wood. Uh, the degree of radius or gouged shape is determined by the shape of the bevel. And by rounding the end, this becomes a very shallow gouge. So we have any questions about that, we can talk about that later too. This is uh, the video or the drawing of my subjects so of get this 
uniform in all your tools and then put a secondary inside if you feel you really need to strengthen the edge. But I wouldn't do that very much until you have a, a broken edge, so. Next subject is uh, parting tools or V-gouge. Uh, the V-gouge has a small radius at the bottom. And if you have, do I have a big one? I don't, yeah, I have a fairly big one. If you look at the bottom of the V-gouge, you've got a bevel on one side and a bevel on the other, and then the radius of the small here, but it winds up looking like a wedge. And that's pushing a wedge through the wood as you carve. Well, if you, after you've done all your sharpening and your edge is complete, if you grind the corner off of that wedge, this little triangle piece, and one off the other side like this without touching the edge, the, it'll slip through the wood easier without trying to force a wedge. We can talk and uh, answer questions on that too. And the next one was, I went and got one. Well, yeah, here it is. If you have a number nine gouge, a number nine is a full half circle. And you have a bevel on the bottom, of course, that's what you sharpen with. But when you look at the end, you have a bevel on each side and that is wedging into the wood when you're carving full depth. So if you, this is a grinding or a belt sander. If you grind the sides flat, uh, not quite to the sharpened edge. If you, if you take that off the top view, if you, Take that wedge off and you make this a long taper on each side, it'll slip through the wood easier. So that's the start of questions. I'm sure somebody has questions about that one. Um, let's see, I have my memory with me, so. George, you um, wanna pause? Let's, do you wanna sure. pause to let's see, see if there's any questions about the sharp see if there's any he questions. Just, he just covered a ton of stuff. <laughs> um, you can let's see i'll try to look at you if you have a question raise your hand or uh, put it in chat or just shout it out i would ask you know, there's v, George, the V tool is hard enough to sharpen as it is. You just made it more complicated. <laughs> These eyes are, so, ideas are so just, if it, if is it this, strikes is this full you. Is this full employment for, for V tool makers? So that when amateurs you'll never, it up like that, they go out and buy some more? You'll well, never you see it? this done. How, how do you, you'll never see how difficult is it to grind it? You grind a little bit and look at it and grind a little bit and look at it. You're trying to get that. If you look at the bottom of it, you'll see a wedge and you're just trying to straighten up like the keel of a boat. You're just trying to straighten up the bottom of that V-gouge and you'll never see this come from a manufacturer. They don't ever sharpen them that way. I do can do feel this, a difference. Do you do this by power or do you do it by on a stone of some kind? Oh, that, good question, good question. I do everything by power. Uh, light touch and power, I do. Uh, belt sanders. I've got uh, felt wheels with uh, abrasive on them for sharpening. Um, and I'll be talking about those a little bit later. But a light touch uh, doesn't burn the steel and you keep water handy for cooling. Um, this is a, a one time thing that you'd want, you know, it'd be years between times you'd have to do this. Uh, I felt a difference. I don't know that everybody would. Uh, it's an idea for discussion and trial. Yeah. So Al asked a related question about the number nine knocking yes. off knocking off the bevel on the outside. 
Yes. It, it, so you, you advocated two things. One is knock it off a little bit so that you, when you stand the tool up and rotate it, you're not, you don't have a dull wedge going through it. The other is you were talking about making a gentle taper over the or longer, longer distance. A longer taper on each side. Uh, it's not, it's just by eye. If you look at the top, you take your number nine and look at the top, you can see there's a wedge on each side at the top corner. And you're pushing that wedge through the wood. If you take that taper and run it out for, I don't know, maybe an inch, it doesn't have to be a long way, but that's a long, a much longer taper than the original bevel. And uh, if you're using a gouge full depth, it slides through the wood easier. Yeah. Yeah. Terry, Terry asked a question and said, could you talk a little bit more about the V-tool? I always find hey. myself muscling through wood with brute force. Well, I think this will help because you have, uh, the, looking at the bottom of the V-tool, the, the V is up here. You can see this little rounded wedge shape that it was made when you, when you sharpen this small, small gouge at the, at the bottom of the V-tool. And if you are trying to make that into like a, the keel of a boat, and it's just a little triangle on each side that you grind, it shouldn't have to interfere with the sharp edge. It just takes that bevel and runs it down to a straight keel. And you're looking at the bottom of the tool in those views, is that right? Right. right. This is this is the V tool, and this is looking at the bottom with the sides uh, angled away. Um, the light is such I imagine you can't see it. You can't. Um, no. Yeah. Well, now Jason's trying. So hold it up again, George. I think it might work. Yeah, that's this is. This is a pretty, pretty straight keel. See the light is just a straight line. It's not the original bevel that was on there when we sharpened this, the two side chisels. Yeah. Okay, okay. I think I got that. I'll give that a try. <clears throat> Heidi asked George, what grit do you use on your belt sander? Okay, a good question. I'll be talking more about that later. Uh, the belt sander is green. This is zirconia that, that works better on steel than uh, aluminum oxide and lasts longer. And I use a, a 120 because I just use this for shaping. And then, uh, well, I, we could just move on into that. So I take a tool and I, uh, I have, always have water for cooling. And the water lasts longer if you keep a lid on it. I learned that in the blacksmith shop. Um, but you can uh, gently, you'll have a spark showing, but you can gently keep your angles and you can bevel uh, and shape the tool on this almost down to a sharp edge, but not quite. And then I have two uh, buffers basically, but uh, they're, they're turned around electronically so they turn up this way. And so you work off the top of the wheel or you can just turn it off and around and the switches on the other side. But this is a felt wheel with 600 grit. And in about 30 seconds, I take the grit from that 120 sanding belt and I go, the sanding belt, I sand across. I sand it this way so the marks are across. In about 30 seconds, I, by going this way on a 600 grit felt, uh, it's totally replaced those marks with linear marks. And I do this again gently until I get down to a wire edge. And then this is a buffing wheel with, uh, I don't, see any difference. There's green stuff and there's stropping compound. There's white stuff. Uh, 
pick the one you like the best. And, and then I turn this one a little bit sideways and I just with 30 seconds, the 600 grit marks are now a mirror image. I mean, a mirror surface. And a mirror surface really slides through the wood better than any kind of sharpening marks. So the next stage is, now we've, bar, we've buffed it inside and out to a mirror surface and it feels sharp, but I don't trust the thumb anymore. I started looking at things to verify the quality of my sharpening selection. This is a 10 power uh, magnifier. And I look at the edge. Does it still have a wire edge? Is it broken? Is it dull from use? And um, sometimes you can feel the wire edge. So I bought a set, of, this is available on Amazon. These are nice small white stones. Uh, it could be hard Arkansas, but those are way more expensive. But for this about 12 bucks or something. And you have rounds and tapers and flats. And many, many years ago, I found a, a square built into like a pencil and tapered. And then I take that little bit of stone and I slide it across that edge. If there's rough spots, it's not sharp. And I rub it back and forth, inside, outside, until there's no rough spots. So it's, I don't know how much metal is taking off. It's just kind of smoothing the spots and, and smoothing them off better than that buffing wheel did or any uh, or regular strop. If you, if you strop a wire edge off until it breaks off, you have a broken edge. And that's not as sharp as, as it could be. So after your wire edge breaks off, stropping, take this and feel for any roughness, smooth it out, and then go back and strop it again. That way you're kind of resharpening that little tiny broken edge from the, from the wire edge that came off. Um, so then I, I take this just back here, just a few strokes on here, uh, get my mirror surface back again. And if you wanna test it with your thumb, make sure that you test it from both directions. Cause if it has a wire edge, you can sense it if it's bent this way. And if it's bent this way, you go like this and it won't feel as sharp. So if it doesn't feel the same from both sides, it's probably got an edge bent over. And that what this does is either straighten up or break off that last little edge and then restrop it. Uh, questions on that one? Well, it's kind of a related one that Jim Spitzer asked. He's kind of bemoaning the fact that he, did he waste his money on his Tormek and various sharpening stones? Or did you ever go that route and have any comments about Tormek or diamond stones or other sharpening systems? They're wonderful. They keep the metal cool. They're kind of expensive, but uh, I'd rather do this for 30 seconds than uh, the Tormac for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I love the uh, honing compound they've got. That's really good stuff. Uh, another little gadget that I bought off of eBay was, I think it was about 16 bucks. This is a hundred power microscope. And when they take a microscope with a hundred power with its own light, and I look at it, it's phenomenal how, how it tells you the quality of the edge. It doesn't have to be that high a quality, but it verifies what process you're using. Uh, I know people that spend way more time sharpening than I do, and they just have fantastic edges. I'd rather be back carving wood. But if you inspect the edge, it can tell you, uh, I like to carve teak and it's very abrasive and that'll give me a rounded edge. If I still have wire edge or yeah, wire edge on there, it can break off, it'll show a broken edge. 
if the steel isn't very good, sometimes it'll show a bent edge. So identifying why it stopped carving the way you wanted um, uh, gets a little clearer if you can see it. Sure. Do you, do you use a different process when sharpening V tools? Not really. No, I just I do the V tool each side on the belt, and then I turn it. Where to go? There it is. So I do. Uh, I always sharpen with my edge parallel to the direction of the of the uh, belt. So I do each side, and then you wind up with this dull triangle at the bottom. And then I take this and I just gently roll it back and forth like you would a small gouge. The, the test that I first use when I'm sharpening is to look at it, get a strong light on it. If you see right, right straight on the edge, if you see any light reflection, it's not sharp. So you grind on it and buff it until you can look at that edge and see no light. <coughs> I hope that answers the question. How do you deal with the inside point ah, of the V tool? Good question. Uh, this little set of white stones has a tapered piece and I've sharpened it kind of like a pencil and that will fit inside. And I go to the bottom of that really small radius and I just push out like this and where the wire edge is, that'll bend it to the outside. And then I buff that edge off. And then I do it this way again. And use this to finish the outside. What is this? Is that another stone? Oh, slip stone? Th this is, a, this is a, a kit with white stones in it. And this one's tapered. So you could use that, but that's really, really, it's usually a smaller radius mm -hmm. than the inside of most uh, parting tools. Uh, so just clean it up until you see no light reflection from that small radius. And then you buff it, uh, or strop it, I mean. You strop it with, a, I have uh, leather with a narrow cord. You have to have a strop that's, um, the same shape as the inside of your parting tool. Hope that answers the question. Yep. I think that's the end of the questions here that I see. Okay. So see if can I can resume. generate some. Yeah. See if I can generate some more. Uh, this uh, grit that I put on the felt here is 600 grit. And the thing to remember, here's a, my assistant here. Has, uh, so I've got a flat strop. And then you can see here, this one I've tapered down to, to fit parting tools. And I have compound on that. And then this one's rounded so that that works the inside of gouges. And that's leather, George, or wood? Yeah. What is that? Leather. I like, I like really thin leather because if it's thick leather, it has a softness that your tool can move into and it puts a little radius right at the edge. Uh, so I like uh, a, a thin leather, so it stays pretty, pretty uh, flat. So the uh, felt wheel for sharpening is, is called 600 grit. It's called greaseless compound. You get it through a supply for uh, auto body people. And this, this is very expensive. It, it'll last a long time, except you have to pack it in something um, sealable with a damp towel in it, because it will dry. And once it's dry, you can't use it anymore. So this has to be soft. And you just rub this onto the wheel while it's running or, or when it's not running, doesn't matter. But this lasts a long, long time and does a wonderful job of sharpening with lots of sparks and stuff without overheating the tool. OK. 
Okay, I've done that page. So we can do uh, handles or we can go make tools. Shall we do some video? Sure. Okay, uh, why don't you, uh, I'll start with just talking about uh, recycling metal. Uh, saw blades work just fine as long as the teeth are made out of the same material as the whole blade. In other words, carbide tooth blades, we don't know what the major uh, blade stock is because they just need the carbide for cutting. So it could be a round blade. Yeah, I've got some that are this big. I've got commercial saw blades that are this wide from the old, old sawmills, uh, but they were before carbide. And the uh, steel seems to be pretty good. And uh, the other option is files. I was gonna have one here, shoot. Uh, if you have some material that you would like to try for making wood carving tools, I'll have a video there that'll show some. Uh, grind on the end of a file and you'll see a very dense pattern of sparks. It's the density you really wanna see. The sparks are burning carbon coming off the steel and the lower carbon content will have sometimes longer sparks, but you can see through them. They'll be less dense. That's why I like to have a comparative sample there. And mild steel has very few sparks. So it's uh, and also not very good for cutting tools. Um, if you test it compared to a file, then you can guess at how much carbon in it. And a file is like 1%, which isn't a whole lot of carbon, but uh, it's uh, a lot more than industrial steel. So we'll take uh, a video. I think I have of, of some grinding on samples and then we'll start working into shaping and heat treat. Yeah. So this is going to be a series of short videos. The first one is only about 15 seconds long. And pay attention to the two streams of sparks coming off of uh, off the wheel. This will take me a moment to set up here. Oh, hang on a minute. Can you nod your head, jury sellers, if you see that grinder? Okay. This is mild steel. I'm going to play that again. There so you can watch it. Yeah, you missed the mild steel. Yeah, that's that's a. File. Oh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, George. I missed up. Yeah. So I make all kinds of stuff with the blacksmith shop, but I'm trying to show our things that are readily available for a non-blacksmith. Oh, that worked earlier, shoot. What's that? That worked earlier. Uh, I can do a little sample here. Did the, did, were, were you able to see the video folks? Yeah. No, it didn't ever show the mild steel sparks. Jerry, did you see it? I got that there. Yeah. Um, I think it worked. Okay. Uh, the point is, have a file to grind on so you can you visually, the, the video doesn't really show how much difference there is. So what do you want to do now, George? Uh, let's go to the, uh, well, let me uh, bring this over, Jason. I want to to uh, to cut a saw blade. 
if you have an angle grinder, which a lot of us have, uh, they make a, a very thin um, cutoff disc for an angle grinder. This was getting worn down. They last a long time. And you can make your layout marks on the saw blade and then cut it out. And there's a video that will show that. It goes pretty quickly. And I was, this shows a whole bunch of sparks going against my leg, but it doesn't seem to generate very much heat. It, uh, but you know, you wear safety glasses. Uh, and I, I take the wearing these uh, new plastic uh, face shields. Um, it, it cuts surprisingly fast and efficiently. Uh, you can cur curve, but straight lines are a whole lot faster and easier. So this is something you can just cut pieces of saw blade and then fit them to the size you want to go on the handle and the size of this blade you want up front. Okay. Let me show the video, George. Of yeah. The, um... Okay. Show the video. That of that process. You can see there's a pretty dense spark pattern. That's pretty good steel in that uh, saw blade. And it was running against my pat leg, but it never even got warm. It's not nearly as... Uh... I'm gonna just do, it, just do that again. In the end, George, you didn't cut it out of the, you didn't cut it off off. Would you just have continued on and dropped it as they were? Yeah, out? yeah, just cut it off, follow the floor. And it, it puts so little heat into the saw blade itself, you could almost pick up the piece right away off the floor. And don't do this in a woodworking shop. Is that the other? No, that's safe? <laughs> There's a lot of fire danger there. So, so go ahead and show the second one for grinding. Okay. Your, your tang should be a little bit narrower than whatever blade width you have. And uh, do that shaping with uh, no uh, concern about overheating it. Just, grind, just get it to shape and put a bevel on it. At this point, you can't hurt the blade because we're going to heat it up and harden it after this. So you're on a different sanding belt here. What's the grid of that belt, do you think? That's about the same thing. Is it? OK. I, I don't remember what grit that is. It, it's irrelevant. You use it off a bench grinder if you want to. It's not, not important. Just use, it, use your uh, angle grinder. Uh, just grind it so, to shape. So here you're forming the tang? Yeah. You make a little shoulder and the tang is narrower than the shoulder. I usually move more smoothly than this. It's uh, So that's just kind of shaped with a tang on it. Uh, you could decide which, we'll talk about different kinds of tangs in a little bit. And are that's you putting, putting a bevel edge? on it. You, yeah. yeah, that's the bevel. And you don't have to worry about overheating at this point? Nope, nope, doesn't hurt a bit. Just go at it, just get it shaped. Well, so far we've got about five minutes involved with the making of this blade. By the time you cut it out, and grind the sides of it. Do you want to go, do you want to continue on to the quenching? Yeah. Thing or do you want to talk okay. a bit? So, so now it's pretty well formed and uh, we'll show the quenching and then I'll show you what I used for quenching. So what we're going to do is heat a, a fire brick 
and put the metal on top of the fire bracket so that the back of the metal doesn't cool off while you're heating. And that's just a butane torch. I'll show it to you in a second. You can't see it very well. It's, this is not a cutting torch or anything. It's just a little uh, Home Depot butane torch. Uh, and it's a magnet. The, the hang down is the magnet. It's better off to have the magnet solid someplace. That was a very good solution, I mean, option. And so you, if you keep heating that, it turns blue and it does, you know, don't worry about the blue. If you want it to turn kind of a medium red, that bucket behind it is a bucket of peanut oil. So any, any vegetable oil will, will be just fine. And that smells a lot better than used motor oil. And turn, turn the blade over periodically. So you're heating from both sides. And this is about 90,000 thick. Now you see it's some red, but it, uh, it's still magnetic. The uh, carbon particles in the steel, now oh, it's sticking back there further, uh, become uh, mobile in the, uh, inside the steel. And while they're mobile, you quench it and they're frozen in place and that's what makes the steel hard. If you let this cool off slowly, the carbon particles settle in and make it back to where it's somewhat uh, bendable. And this one, you keep heating it until the magnet doesn't stick. And then you heat it again because it takes a little bit of time and you take it from the heat dry and quench it, uh, cool it off. Okay, the next stage. So here's the, am I back on now, Larry? You are, yes, you are now. Yep. Okay, so this is just the little pro, blue propane bottle from any of the uh, uh, Home Depot kind of places. And that's enough to heat it on a fire brick. It doesn't matter what kind of fire brick until it's non-magnetic and then you quench it and then wipe the oil off, have a paper towel or something there and then put it in an old toaster oven or if you're on uh, good terms with your wife, you could put it in the kitchen oven. Uh, but I suggest you get uh, an aftermarket temperature gauge that's much, much better than a toaster oven. And you put it at 400 degrees for an hour. And that doesn't hurt a little vegetable oil in the, in the uh, oven doesn't hurt anything. So it's, uh, you heat it up and quench it is the hardening process. And, and soaking at 400 degrees is called tempering. So it's, you've got a stiff, hard, hard blade that'll break the edge. At 400 degrees, it toughens that up a little bit. So it'll hold an edge longer. Questions about heat treat? There's a question about butane versus propane. Is the butane torch hotter than a propane torch? Which will work better? I don't think there's a difference. For this, this one is called uh, propane, but I have used butane. I, it, it may be a little difference in time, but we're only talking about pretty thin material and you just have to heat it longer to get it to that non-magnetic. It'll work. Oxyacetylene torch will work fine too. Or you come over and we'll stick it into my 2000 degree blacksmith forge. <laughs> that heats a lot faster. <laughs> Other questions? If that flame hit the uh, peanut oil, would that cause a fire? Uh, I don't think so because it, the local peanut oil will have to get up to temperature to, and there's so much of it, there's so much oil. But if you put, if you get that red hot blade, if anybody has to have seen forged in fire, if you get a hot blade and you put it in the oil and you bring it out too soon, that blade will light up because there's still too much temperature in the blade. So you stick it in that peanut oil and leave it there until it's uh, not flaming. They do that. You, uh, they do that on forge and fire just for the flame. It's just showmanship. 
real blacksmiths would never take it out of there while it was still hot enough to flame. Can you use clean motor oil? Just go buy a quart of motor oil and do use that. I would not go go buy a quart of vegetable oil. Okay. Don't, it it just smells. It's uh, it's petroleum, and the uh, the vegetable oil or peanut oil. I got mine from a hamburger stand. They had uh, this is what they cook uh, French fries in, and go see if you can get some free oil from a hamburger place. Okay. The Dennis Mills asks, do you quench after temper? It's not necessary. Uh, the tempering doesn't heat it up about 400 degrees and the carbon doesn't get very mobile. So it doesn't change any, uh, any quality of the steel. Okay. George, there's an older question I missed about the uh, automotive greaseless compound. Okay. Is it, is it used as a buffing compound for in the auto repair operation and where do you buy it? I got mine online. Uh, if you put, if you search for, uh, well, this is Satin Glow is the name I got, but this is like five years old. Uh, greaseless compound is the thing you want because it's water-based. It doesn't have grease in it. But being water-based, you have to keep it moist so it doesn't dry out. And I have 400 grit and I have 600 grit and the 600 to me works really well. And you're putting that on the felt wheel, is that correct? Correct. A st oh, uh, uh, a stiff felt wheel, not the, uh, the soft, spongy, sewn cloth. Uh, I want something that holds its shape so that we, I can, I can uh, keep a flat surface that I've made on my belt sander. Um, and um, not, not get rounded from a, a soft wheel. You can dent into it. You want a, a wheel that doesn't dent. So it's, they have some that are called rock hard. I don't think you have to go that hard, but uh, at least medium to firm. Okay. I'm experimenting with uh, a, a different kind of wheel. I just bandsaw this out of uh, uh, MDF. And this is a uh, jeweler's mount with a tapered uh, screw on it. Oh, wrong direction. And I've done this a couple times and it doesn't work every time, but it's worth trying. And then uh, take a belt sander to this and just very lightly touch it and it rounds it right up to a nice and this has enough texture to hold on to that uh, greaseless uh, compound. So you don't, felt wheels are fairly expensive, but yeah. And then For I got you, several. Go ahead. For those in the, uh, those of you attending, uh, we're hoping to do more on power sharpening and stropping with uh, good Gil Drake. Uh, if you attended his overview of his the Drake Knives process, Gil has uh, lots and lots of grinders uh, set up for his various um, blades that he makes. He does make his own MDF wheels just like George described. And he's got a setup that makes precision wheels. He's actually gonna donate two of the wheels to the club. And so we'll have them in hand, but some of us are using razor sharp kind of variations of those as a commercial uh, wheel that can be loaded up. There's a lot of sure. interesting, a lot of interesting topics going through this uh, for those that are kind of going down the power, power sharpening, power stropping, power honing kind of a process. Uh, Just remember the, then, when you're, yeah, when you're grinding and and using the 600 grit, use a light touch because it can overheat quickly. So Dennis and sisters, Dennis, thank you, uh, said if you have trouble finding it, I assume we meaning the uh, satin glow, it says look up Formax, F-O-R-M-A-X. They make all kinds of abrasive compound, compounds. They make most of the green stropping compound you can buy. And George's compound is made by Formax. 
Yeah, I don't have a name yep. for that anymore. It yeah. lasts a long, long time. Yeah. So when I buy my green compound at uh, at Woodcraft, it's made. It's, it comes in a four max box, the little sticks. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, um, George. We'll... Ha handles next. Uh, my sensitivity is I want my handles to be directly in line with the edge of the blade so that when I have, that's not a good one here. Um, if I have a curved blade, it needs to have a little offset near the handle so that this line lines up with the cutting edge. If it stays, I don't see a good sample now. Uh, if it stays off center, you have to do more wrist action. So whatever you make, try to keep it, the cutting edge, wherever it goes, in line with the handle. So how do you keep the handle straight? So you take your handle stock, whatever you're gonna use, you find the center on both ends and center punch them. Now, if you have a drill press, what I like to do is I take a block of wood, put a pin through it. This could be wood just as well as metal uh, and bevel it so it comes to a point. And then you put a, a, a wire in here, the same size that you're gonna drill for the handle and move this around until these line up point to point. Then, Take that out and you put this, this happens to be an eighth inch drill, but it, we're just a pilot. This is just a pilot hole. And then you put oh, one of your center punch marks in this point down here. And then when you drill the other center point mark, that drill is headed right for that other and it stays center all the time. I'm really pleased with center to center drilling. So if you don't have a drill press, I made this one out of metal, but it could just as well be made out of a piece of wood. It's just a reference bar with a hole through here. It's kind of the size of your uh, drill size. And then you, at the other end, you have a hole through with a tapered pin sticking out like the tailstock of a lathe. And then you can sand and uh, whatever it takes to get these two lined up, just like this. As long as they're lined up, uh, then you take your drill It goes through here and your block of wood you put in the center punch and then you can just hold this and drill this boom like that and you only need to go in about an inch because it's a pilot then you figure out how long your tang is and you drill your pilot the depth that you need a little bit longer than the tang so you can make this out of all wood because you only use it once in a while and it's not gonna wear out. But this one should be pretty hard wood or you can make it out of the metal, whatever. Then, uh, if you get vintage tools, like I love the vintage tools and a lot of them come with these tapered tangs. And I said, why do they go to all the trouble of a square tapered tang and I finally figured it out. So you got that eighth inch pilot hole, put this in a vise. Now eighth, this is, this I came off of there, but it was an eighth inch hole. And then you turn this just like a router and those little corners on that square tapered tang will route that until it fits, fits. And you get up to about a quarter inch and then you tap it in place. And the only things that bite in are the corners of that taper, but it fits all the way to the bottom of the hole 
and this just it stays in that tool well sometimes for decades or generations uh, you can't pull it out by hand with a quarter inch of interference when you tap it in that's if you're rehandling a vintage tool with a tapered if you want to redo a chisel that has a plastic handle and you think it's not holding the edge and you put it on the grinder and it, it looks like it has pretty good spark uh, break that plastic off of there grind it back to a, a i don't know maybe a two inch taper square taper drill your power hole then you reheat that uh chisel that you had heat it up non-magnetic and quench it and bake it 400 degrees and then you ream your new handle up to about a quarter inch and tap it on and it'll work fine um, sometimes i make tools with just like a quarter inch shank on them and then you have a quarter inch hole that follows that that uh, pilot hole that you put in to start with and you this isn't quite but you, you get that so it will fit in there easily this is not fitted for that and then uh, fill it with epoxy and they epoxy the whole thing in there all the way down remember you cut a corner at the corner so all the way down to where that corner is and that'll never come apart this is my high-tech uh, handle material some people call it trex so uh, i use plastic decking for handles sometimes uh, questions on handles or how do you decide what size pilot hole to, to drill on for an, an old tank? Okay, good question. I'm gonna take this one apart. If you grip that and then twist it back and forth, see there's not much gift to it, but if you, now that had this off a couple of times already. There, um, diagonal across the corners, just above the point. And this was an eighth of an inch up, up about, a quarter inch of the diagonal is about uh, a quarter inch. So you want this support all the way down. Uh, to almost the point. So that you can see that what the shape of inside this handle is going to be just exactly what you see right here. Except it's going to be round because you've been doing this and dumping the stuff out and grind it like that and dump it out and eventually it gets up to about there and then you tap it in place and that's ready to go are most old tools square tang square tape yes. tang the, the, all the ones that i've gotten have been uh, a square taper and i love the vintage ones uh, i've got six drawers of tools that were made uh 1840 to 1870 and uh every one of them i rehandled has a square taper are palm tools the same way i don't know i haven't had to replace any handles on palm tools that's just one way either either it's tapered and you ream it by hand almost and then set it or if it's straight they use drill a clearance hole and fill it with epoxy. Do you, uh, when you're making your own handles, are you drilling first and then shaping the handle afterwards? Yes, I, uh, I just put it down. Oh, I usually uh, square them up, but that's not necessary. Uh, let's say you had a vintage handle that you really liked and the hole's too big. Drill it out to a dowel size, glue the dowel in, center punch both ends and start over. Um, some people want to turn them on a lathe. Again, center punch and uh, drill to center. Does that answer that one? 
Yeah, I think so. Dennis asked, "What about your tapered plug method?" But I assume that's what you just described. Oh, well, I was going to go. I was going to go to that next. If you have, uh, okay, you have a. Here we go. No, I can't get that. I don't know if you can see the end of that one. It's got half a dowel on each side. And so I take a, 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 a wooden dowel. I usually use quarter inch, but that's choice. And since this has some thickness, uh, I saw the end of the dowel lengthwise. I should have had one here and I can't find one. Um, there we go. So I, I saw it lengthwise, and then before I cut it off the dowel, I put it on the sander or, or carve it by hand, taper it so it's smaller at the bottom end. Then I take a tool and set it in a hole, and then I put, usually the dowel is longer than this so that I can So that I could then force that in uh, tight on each side. And then I cut the rest of the dowel off. This one's already been cut off, so that's how far it goes in. Now, I, without working at it, I can't get that uh, blade out. I've never had one come out under service like that. But if you wanted to reshape or retemper or whatever that blade, as you see, you clamp a device and wiggle it a little bit, those dowels can come out. If you don't want the dowels to come out, uh, put a touch of glue in there and it'll, they'll just stay forever. So um, if, you, if you guess wrong on the size of the hole and the size of the dowel, do you just split the handle? Is that right? Then you start over? Has that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. Sometimes you'll split the handle if you try to put too much tapered pressure in there. So it doesn't have to be really, really tight. You just put it in there till it's snug and then cut the rest off. Yeah. Could you, George, at the very beginning, you, you showed a long bent tool where the, yeah. the tip, how do you drill a hole that's not straight in order to compensate for that? Or do you? No, the hole, the tang hole is straight. Is that what you meant? This part? Yeah. Um, so, you start with that straight and then you you heat this up and until it's a medium red and bend it. It could be between two pins. It could be over a, a curved surface. Uh, it could be over a piece of wood. Uh, this isn't going to bend, uh, burn the wood until it's gone. You just have a piece of... Uh, hardwood with a radius on it uh, and start at the tip and just pound it and it, it will bend if it's red. Don't try yeah. to bend it after it's not red anymore. I, I think I was trying to ask a different question. Okay. So at the very beginning, you said you want the handle to be in the line of drive with the edge of the tool. Okay, that's that, that for an edge, the ed, end start sharpened tool. This is a side sharpened tool. Does that I'm make going back, a difference? I'm going back to the end sharpened version. Do you, okay. Is there any is there any situation where you have to drill a handle hole that's not straight up and down? No, no. The this part is always straight, and then it there. This one. The part that goes in the handle is straight, and then you jog it down, and the blade comes back up. Okay. Can you see? Got that it. one. Got so it. you yep. put a goose stick in the just in front of the handle. Yep. Got it. So this one, I, I'm still experimenting with these. This one's made for spoon carving. And uh, I took a piece of heavy uh, spring, 
cut off a, one lip and, and uh, heat it up and straightened it out a bit and welded the spot. And then this is a half of a, a trailer hitch ball. And if I heat this to red when it was flat, put this on top of it and hit it with a hammer, um, it might take two or three cycles because it cools off very quickly. You get this, this shape pretty uniformly because it follows the shape of the top tool. And then uh, bend this gooseneck a little bit until the, the tang lines up with the edge. This is old saw blade. Uh, this one I made as a spoon or, or bowl carving. I'm, I still haven't figured out how to do these right, but this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, this is a saw blade. I mean, a file, there's still file marks on the back of this one. And so this has only one sharpened edge. You, as you're carving, you can use your holding hand on the spoon if you watch videos for spoon carving, they do a lot of this kind of power. So if we're talking about end sharpened again, uh, let's see if I have a good sample here. I don't see them. Anyway, so we have a chisel, um, a straight chisel, let's say. If I wanted to do the mallet on this, if I hit on this, that shoulder is just going to drive down in and split the handle. So the traditional way is to put a, a bolster, a flare on the tool itself, and then a ring to hold the handle together. Another alternative that I have found is you figure out how long your tang is, and you drill a hole across the handle and put a steel pin in it. So now I can hammer on this tool and the tang rests is, is a quarter inch straight, it's not tapered, and it rests on that steel dowel and that's all it goes, it never goes any further. So you can stop the end of the tang or you, I haven't been successful yet putting a bolster on there. Uh, and on these, uh, saw blade types. My uh, my tools, this is what got me going to make tools in the first place. I wanted to change this to a smooth transition. So my bolster, instead of being a sharp shoulder and get smaller, I can forge a taper with a, a straight tang. And these are made out of uh, bearings, ball bearings and roller bearings which are just fantastic steel. These just have unbelievable uh, durable edges uh, and they just slide through the wood. But that's my love. <laughs> that's just what keeps me busy. Um, so if you want uh, a specialty tool for uh, relief carving, you need to get underneath a recess or something. Uh, if you take an old tool, I told you, wiggle this and get the handle off of there. Heat this up to a medium red and bend it over some hardwood or metal or whatever is in your vise. Just put a, a dowel, a, like a one inch dowel across there and you could tap it around and then come back here and get the shape you want pre-grind it to the taper, the bevel that you want, heat it up to non-magnetic and quench it, 400 degrees in the oven and you start over and put this all back together. The, you can't do all that stuff with a wooden handle on it. George, just go back to that example one more time, please. Okay. So that, that steel is hardened and tempered before yes. when it was straight. Do you have to anneal it and soften it before you do the heating? When you heat it to, no. When you heat it to non-magnetic, that softens it. Okay. And you bend it red. You bend it uh, while it's hot. And just repeat that like any 
blacksmith movie we ever saw until you get the shape that you want. Yeah, you can reheat it and reheat it and bend it, heat it and bend it, heat it, but it doesn't hurt anything until you get the, the shape you want. And then sometimes I'll start grinding on it. It doesn't look quite right. So I'll heat it up and bend it some more. You can abuse it terribly until after the oil quench. And then you can't, uh, you, you don't want to turn it blue anymore. <coughs> but these are really handy. You can see if you're working on a, a background of a relief carving, this gets into some places that a straight chisel can't go. And these, these come in all different kinds of designs. Uh, any more questions, folks, please? I've got a question about steel. Okay. There's a myth, there's a, I don't know if it's a myth or a reality that pre-World War II steel was better than post-World War II steel. Is there, is there in, the, in the long run, are there ages of steel that are better than others? And is modern steel worse or better than old steel? Or how do you, <laughs> can you tell? Okay, how often do you run across tools that were pre-World War II? You don't see very many of them. Uh, the tools that I get were uh, pre-World War I, but they had a steel supplier that was unmatched. The steels that they <coughs> used was phenomenal. Now, remember a little history. They didn't make modern steel until 1865, and they didn't make anything but railroad iron until World War I. So they weren't making high carbon steel in the big melting pots. Really good quality steel had to be made in small quantities. And there was a guy in Sheffield that figured out how to do it. And that's why Sheffield became noted as the steel of the world because this guy, and he never told anyone how he did it. He died with it. But there were other people in the area that figured it out. There was good steel came from Sheffield for many decades. So I, uh, okay. But, at, but other than that, production steel wasn't as good as modern steel. If, if you're not happy with uh, re redoing saw blades and files, go buy steel. The steels that you want to look at are. 1095, 01, uh, there's some others, but uh, those are really good, simple, serviceable steels. And uh, you can get eighth inch by one, fairly cheap for a foot, I mean, like 15 bucks for a foot and you can get several tools. Then you know exactly what the steel you've got. And those will work great. 1095 or 01, they're very, very similar. Well, I need the incentive to make up more stories. So any other questions? There are no more in the chat, but I'm just going to pause and have a pregnant pause for people to think about it. So now is the moment, as opposed to five minutes or 10 minutes from now. Obviously, you can email George. You can find his email yeah, address, can, but there are other, other, ways, other ways to do that. Uh, there's a link. Uh, Amazon, there's a link on the in the chat room for the uh, the 600 grit greaseless stuff that uh, the satin glow that uh, the George found. Uh, any and remember that? On, yeah. So there's that a has question. To be stored. Yeah. Go ahead. Any thoughts on stainless steel? Uh, don't bother. It won't hold a good carving edge. Spitzer, Jim Spitzer says, just want to say the most impressive presentation. Thanks very much. Are there short reference works oh, good, that, summar good. That, summar that summarize? I guess, Jim, are you asking about articles or books, those kind of things? Well, there's a book on, on heat treat. It's about that thick. Uh, 
which I have no idea what's in it. That's beyond me. I do want to put in a plug for uh, Chris Pye. He's a British carver and has uh, a website that he sells uh, carving lessons. He talks about tools and carvings and uh, a fantastic resource. Just to, if you learn everything he has to teach, you'll be just fantastic. Um, a little expensive, I think it's about $120 a year now, I think. But the photography is fantastic. Uh, not very many pictures of him. His photography is all right there where the edge is. And um, if you want, and, and once you pay your like $125, you can go back and see his 200 videos. Uh, you get access to everything he's got. He's just really wonderful. Yeah. I've read a lot of books on sharpening and carving and nothing cuts close to what he does. And nothing I've seen. Yeah, he did a he did a DVD with Rob Kostman on sharpening that's now out of print. It used to be distributed on Vimeo. I found a used copy. The, I say the Carving Sig has a copy of that DVD if anybody's interested in in that um his sharpening DVD. He also on the service that George talked about does does go over similar or the same sharpening. Uh, Tom Willig asks, so there, he says, uh, I'm curious about small draw knives. Do you have any good pieces of wisdom about small draw knives? Um, I haven't done that. So I won't say. Um, Again, you can buy a piece of steel that's almost the right shape and just grind the tangs, uh, bend them and put a bevel on it. Yeah. And then you, when you buy steel, it's already softened and annealed. So you could just grind away and do anything you want to it and then heat it up and quench it. And a similar Give it a try. Vein, in a similar vein, I asked George if he would consider making me a fro using the Drew Langster model. And so we're we're talking about that. If anybody else wants to consider that, give me a give me a jingle or send me an email. That's uh, underway. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? Um, Michael asked, "Is there uh, there's so much information here? Do you teach classes?" I haven't. But if enough uh, questions came up about one subject, we can try this again. But I'm in, I'm in Redmond, Oregon, and I'm always up for visitors. So we could work out something if somebody's coming by. Okay. Tom Willig asks, what about coil springs for tools you form yourself? I, I've been through a lot of coil springs. Uh, as you imagine, Garage door springs get broken all the time. So those are free. Uh, but pure iron has no carbon. High carbon steel has 1%. And coil springs have about 0. 0.5 to 0.6%. Uh, it could be a, a workable tool, but not as good as if you had high carbon steel. Like uh, your... Your fro is going to be spring steel. George, some of the tools we buy have chromium or some other sort of rare thing in them. How do you how do we think about those as being practical versus marketing gimmicks? Uh, those are a lot of marketing. They don't want their tools to rust. I'm not worried about rust, so I'd rather have simple chrome or uh, carbon steel. Uh, L. L. Plash asks George, "Did you sharpen that pencil shape in the stone for checking yeah. the edge? And how did you do it?" That's on a grinder, any old bench grinder. Yeah. Gently, gently. It, it wants to break, so you want to do it very softly. Yeah, but it lasts a long, long time. Yeah. So Dennis, your friend Dennis from Sisters says, I, I try to visit him often. <laughs> Dennis, <no. laughs> yeah, we have a good time on projects. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, 
Uh, I don't have answers. I have just experience. Um, what I say is true now, but it may change next week. Um, and I, I've been watching Chris Pye for years, and his sharpening now is different than when I first started. He has a, a role of, of bench-mounted motors behind him now, too. George, I'm going to give you a pause just for a minute, and I'm going to ask Dennis Mills and Scott Byer to, if they would unmute themselves and just mention a little bit about your individual activities. Dennis, you have a, a forum on Google, Google Groups, as I recall, and Scott, you're the leader of the Central Oregon carving thing. You want to can I spot you, spotlight you, Scott? Are you willing to talk about that? What the group, the nature of it, <coughs> what what's normal when it is normal, how all that works? Um, we have an open carving session once a month, and we've done some shows. Uh, library. Uh, I was at the Deschutes County Fair a couple of years ago, but we're pretty informal. We don't really have elected officers. Uh, mostly we just like to carve and we try to try to be unorganized, I guess. Uh, but I will say for George's tools, his roller bearing blades are, are as good or better than the file or feel carving tools I have. Uh, yeah, that roller bearing stuff is good. But uh, yeah, we haven't been we haven't been organized and that's almost by choice. Uh, like I say, we just like to carve and so we don't have dues. Uh, we don't have an organization, we don't have officers. Uh, we're just carvers. Yeah. And, I'll, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dennis. But Scott, just a final question. You frequently meet at your place for the carve-in? Yeah. Kind of a thing, and that's in Bend? Yep. Yep, okay. And we welcome all comers. Well, there's a lot of a lot of mobility back and forth between, I think, Central Oregon and the Portland metro area. So I look forward to getting there again sometime. Dennis, are you still here? I can't see everybody. Well, it sounds like we might be wearing people out. So if there's no more questions. Oh, we could be, yeah. There's Dan. Hang on just for a minute. Dennis, are you willing to talk about your uh, your woodworking group? Nope, got the wrong person. Sorry. Wrong person. Okay. Wake up. Here we go. Okay, let's go back to George. Um, there's a question. Hey, yeah. This is go Tom ahead. Willing. What uh, is the meeting schedule for that group that was just talking? Well, it's indefinite right now. Aha. Uh -huh. How would one get one's name on the list to get a heads up on when it is? If you, you go about... to, do you want me to take it? Yeah. If you go to centraloregonwoodworkers.net, there is a sign up for the Sisters Area Woodworking Group, the Central Oregon Woodworkers Group, and then the Central Oregon Carvers. And if you just click on the join, uh, for example, if you click on the join for the carvers group. I will get an email and then I will add you to the mailing list uh, in answer to your original question. When we are not having a pandemic, we've been meeting on the second Tuesday of every month from one to four. Uh, and once we're all vaccinated, we'll be doing it again. And with that, I'll back to mute. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michael asked George the question that looks like a Garrett Way device that you have. Can you speak about oh. how you use it? 
This one? I think. This this why? Uh, this is called a pair advice. And it uh, is really flexible. Horizontal spins on a pin. Vertical moves anywhere you want it. And when you put tension on it, it doesn't move anymore. Uh, Grizzly makes one like this. And I, you can find old ones once in a while, eBay and stuff. If you do a search for a pair advice, this will come up. The Debbie and Dana asked, where is the Chris Pye video subscription site? Is it at YouTube or is his own site? I think he's got his, I, I think, I think it's his own site. site. Just, yeah. just Google Chris, Chris Pye. Pye. Yeah. He's got a, his lesson things, they've got a TV, like a television, but a TV in it. But if you just type Google Chris Pye wood carving, we're carving. Yeah, P, <clears> that's P Y E. You'll find yeah, his site. That's P, yeah, P Y E, Chris P Y E. Okay, let's see. We're about. I think we're running out of gas, folks. Any final questions? Last call before the bar closes. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, participating, for your attention. Thank you, George, for being willing to do this. Well, you bet. Cleaning. I'm sure your shop is always that clean and that organized. Always, always, always. yeah. Right. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's one one side benefit of having people stop over and looking at your your living room, right? Or your family uh, room. Just, so it's, uh, just don't ask my wife that question. It's, there we yeah. go. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, all right. Hope, Hopefully see you around. You're welcome always. Good carving, uh, guys. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye-bye. So, L, twice in one day. Gary, twice in one day. <laughs> You're muted. You're still muted, Al. I see your lips. Your lips are moving. There. Okay. There. Yeah. That there was a really there an interesting go. presentation. Thank you for. Uh, yeah, that up. I went golfing today, and oh my gosh, am I sore? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I haven't done it in years because of my knees. It's called Tylenol or Aleve or ibuprofen. Yeah, I'm or, getting right. ready to do that. <laughs> it's, just, it's absolutely amazing how, how well that stuff works. Thanks again. Yeah. Was, okay, awesome. thanks, guys. Yeah, we'll take care. Hey, Larry, I need to know how to change my name in the Zoom. Oh. What kind of computer, Gary, what kind of computer do you have? I have a MacBook Pro. Okay, so I do, I do too. So you see your, your image. Just move your mouse over your face and click it once. Okay. And I, what should come up, you either see one of two things. There's three three little dots that says mute and then in blue and then next to that says three dots. Yeah. Click the three dots. Okay. And then look, look at that list and there should be one that says rename. Okay, rename. Click on rename. I did. And a little window oh, will come okay. up and it'll show your name. And then just backspace off of the last name, presumably. Yeah, because it got screwed up. And then just start typing whatever you want to type and then hit enter or okay, whatever, whatever it is. There you go, Gary Hensley.
Now you can go back and do it again and put a space in between. What I've been asking people to do is to rename themselves and put a like a dash and then the city that they're at or the name of their club. Yeah. So you can see oh, Roger. Yeah. Roger's on the Scottish screen. He he successfully put Milwaukee, Oregon. I got dash Portland on mine. I can do the same thing. I can as a host, I can I've got the power to rename people. I put the space in. There you go. Okay. Now you know how to do it. Now the only question is, how do you, how do you remember how to do it, right? That that's beyond my uh, <laughs> capabilities. Yeah. Well, after about four times, you kind of figure it out. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I have an iPad. I tried to do it, and I never saw a change name with those three dots. It. I I forget mm -hmm. how to do it on the iPad. It, there is a way to do it because I've done it, and I think usually. Is there a three dots in the upper right hand corner? Yes. Of the iPad. Yes. What happens up there? It just it just goes to raise hand chat meeting settings, which didn't have anything minimis, Set, minimize meeting. Settings didn't have it. Uh, no. Uh, topic no. Oh wait, show name when participant join. Okay. Nope. Doesn't doesn't have a change it so next time we meet so if you're coming back on monday i'll, I'll have my ipad we'll, we'll, we'll play around there is okay. a way to do it it's, it's a little obscure the only other i'll, I'll probe around let you know thank you, you. Be able to, yeah that you know people are on iphones they're on ipads they're on android devices they're on macs they're on windows systems and so these uh you know everybody thinks that Everybody's got exactly what they have, which turns out not to be true. Yeah. <laughs> just not true. Well, thanks, Larry. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thank Gary, you for asking. <laughs> hey, no problem. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. Okay. We'll take Bye. care. Okay. See you later. See you later.